Aloha, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Happy Halloween. You can go to Love in France, but you cannot become a Frenchman. You can go to Love in Germany or Turkey or Japan, but you cannot become a German or Turk or Japanese. But anyone from any corner of the earth can come to Love in America and become American. Welcome back to A Nation of Immigrants, a new talk show program featuring the lives of immigrants, knowledge, diversity, and inclusion. Created by Think Tank Hawaii and the Kingsfield Law Office, we invite renowned immigrants to come to the show to discuss their life stories, immigration adventures, and contributions to cultural diversity. Today, it's my great honor to invite my advisor, my mentor, my teacher, Professor Jonathan Fenberg, to the show. Professor, how are you? I'm great. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Professor. We know each other for 22 years. You are the first American I knew. And uh, I learned so much from you for the, in the past 22 years, and I'm continuing learning. And today we want to learn about your uh, family history. I know Marianne, your fantastic wife, fantastic novelist. I know Noni, uh, Maya, and uh, uh, Henry, and your children. But uh, uh, I didn't know much about your parents or your grandparents. Uh, but first, please allow me to read a very abridged version of your bio. Your bio is going to take me five hours to read the full version, but uh, please. Uh, allow me just to read a shorter version so we can begin the interview. I can ask, I have so many questions I want to ask you about you. So Professor Jonas Fenberg is a very prominent art historian of modern and contemporary art. In my view, he's the best art historian in the United States. He's the program director of the PhD in creativity program at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia and a Gatchel Professor Emeritus from the University of Illinois Urbana Champagne, he's the author of Art Things 1940, Strategies of Being, the mostly wide read survey of postmodern art, and a co-creator of Imagine America Icons of 20th Century American Art, the award-winning PBS television documentary of 2005. Professor Fenberger is the author of first major monograph on the leading Chinese artist Zhang Xiaogang. Professor Fenberger is also the author of some 30 art books and catalogs of modern art that have been translated into multiple languages. His most recent book is Modern Art at the Border of Mind and Brain. And also pleased to report that Professor Fenberger's uh, important books on children's art trilogy has been published. And uh, one is very theoretical, two of them are more uh, art uh, history oriented. One of them has been translated into Chinese language and has been very well received by the international readership. Well, this is a, just a very short abridged version, Professor. As I uh, eagerly jump into asking your questions, you grew up in Chicago and your father was a very uh, prominent uh, scholar as well. But how about your grandparents? Well, my father was a psychoanalyst, and even that was sort of an accident of his birth and background. You know, to back up a little bit, my his parents uh, emigrated to the United States from mm -hmm. probably from um, you know the Baltic region, uh, mm -hmm. just, you know, and um, from either Lithuania or Estonia, and. Um, and they and he was born in New York when they landed in New York, um, and then they were on their way to Cleveland. So he, they were only briefly in New York, but that's where he was born. Um, I don't. I'm not even sure what their name was before that, but we know that once they went through Ellis Island, their name was Feinberg, um, and they then and they then went to <laughs> Cleveland. And he had there were there were he had five siblings, or he was one of five siblings. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Cleveland, and it was the Depression, and um, so they lived in a Jewish ghetto in Cleveland, and and uh, his father started a, 
a, a cheese business in Cleveland. Oh, and my and my father used to uh, remember um, as a as a young man hauling milk cans on and off of a horse drawn cart that they had to deliver them the milk and cheese to people mm -hmm. in Cleveland. And um, uh, he then um, he was interested in in uh, field zoology. He went to the um, uh, to Ohio State University, and he and he was interested in um, in field zoology. And his professor at the time said, "There is no way that a Jew can get a professorship in field zoology in America today. So you should do something else." Which year was that? That would have been probably about 1935. 35, oh, okay. And uh, so he went, uh, he decided to put himself on a ship and went down to, um, to Sao Paulo, Brazil to study um, in, a, in a very famous research institute called Butantan, oh. which was the, wor the world's most famous research place for reptile study. And he came back with a, a little, my brother still has this leather bound book that he made where he meticulously drew the anatomy of snakes, heads, and other kinds of things. But while he was down there, he wasn't down there very long. Um, and he had some relatives there. His father's brother had gone to Brazil. So mm -hmm. he knew some people in Brazil. And he, um, anyway, he was down there for a short time and he received a letter from his mother saying mm -hmm. that. She had applied to medical school for him, and he got in, and she paid the first year of tuition, and he had to come home. Wow. So, <laughs> so he came home, and he went to medical school, and he graduated about 1939. And by that time, he had met my mother, mm -hmm. and her parents, her, uh, she never knew her father. But her, but, uh, and, she, and she grew up in, a, in, in an orphanage in Cleveland, and, but her mother worked in the orphanage and she knew her and, um, and I knew her. I mean, I eventually met her and I, and I met my father's parents uh, as well, but didn't really know them. Um, I met my, uh, my father's mother only once when I was very young um, and in Cleveland and, um, and his father I knew as a very old man, but you know, I was quite young and then he died. And um, mm. but my mother's mother, I knew well. Mm. And um, so and but I don't know what I don't know what my mother's father's origins were. But my mother's mother uh, had been born in the United States somewhere in Pennsylvania. And I think her parents also emigrated to the United States um, from probably also from uh, Lithuania or mm. you know, Estonia, that sort of region. So they, they were all Eastern European Jews. And um, my father um, went to medical school. It's an incredible story. He went to medical school and met my mother in Cleveland. Um, they got married. She was 19 years old. Um, and, uh, they, and when he finished his medical school training, they went down to, um, to New Orleans for his internship. And in those days, uh, in, interns had were required to live in the hospital, and um, and wives were not permitted. So she had to find an apartment somewhere, mm -hmm. and they had no money because nobody got paid anything in those days as interns. And uh, he went to Charity Hospital in New Orleans, which was the largest public hospital in the country, and um, at the time. But remember, this is before penicillin, mm -hmm. so. He's down there, and they're, that's the DeBakey brothers were doing heart surgery, pioneering heart surgery in a converted garage in New Orleans. And he was down there training. And one day he saw a, uh, an advertisement on the bulletin board that, uh, for a country doctor. Mm -hmm. So he mm -hmm. and my mother packed up. Um, they, uh, she, she had been living over a restaurant in the, in the French Quarter of New Orleans, and in fact, over a restaurant called Two Jacks, which is still there. And the family just took pity on her, gave her a room with a flashing Coca-Cola sign in the window um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, used to, and used to feed the two of them occasionally. Um, but so they took this job in the, in the Bayou country of uh, Louisiana, in Southern Louisiana. 
And at the time, there was a telegraph line that ran through what is what the parish, which is like the county, and um, and and there was one road, and my father would would get a, a notification on the telegraph line that somebody was sick and needed the doctor, and they would jump in their jeep, and my mother would bring a blanket and Ritz crackers, and he brought his his uh, his um, medical bag and they had no idea what they were going to find. And they would go, drive up to wherever it was they'd been called and they'd get there and they'd find, um, uh, he said one time he saw some, uh, typically he was, he would, nobody would call the doctor until they were so sick, they couldn't work anymore. So, and uh, so he would find people with staph infections that were so advanced that they were blown up like balloons. Um, and they would treat that with sulfur drugs because they didn't have, um, Penicillin. They had no antibiotics yet. Uh, that didn't come in uh, until a few years later. Mm -hmm. And then um, my um, uh, so one time he said he he went up there and some guy had cut his hand off with an axe. Um, and he got up there and he 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 picked up the hand and he got safety pins and retractors. You know when you when you cut the ligaments in the hand, the the, the ligament retracts into a into a sort of a sheath. And you have to reach in there and pull them out. So he pulled them all out, reconnected them with safety pins until he got them all connected, sewed them back together, um, and then jumped in his Jeep and ran back to see if he got the anatomy right. He went to go find his anatomy book to see if he got it right. And the guy got his hand back, which is unbelievable. He, he lost some nerves, but the hand was still working. Anyway, so that was there. And then, and then the war started, and my father saw this coming. Um, and especially as a Jew, I think he felt um, some particular um, uh, commitment about about fighting Hitler, yep. and um, and so he um, he volunteered, and they sent him off because he was a doctor. They sent him off to Hawaii, mm -hmm. um, and so he and my mother went landed in Honolulu. They lived in an army uh, house right on the end of Hickam Field, right next practically next to um, Pearl Harbor. And so that's where they were. And he was, and he said, you know, nobody thought there was anything uh, potentially going to happen. Mm -hmm. And he said he almost never wore his uniform, that, that the officers all would go play golf and, you know, drink at the officers <laughs> club. And, and that once a week they would, they would test the big cannon. So there's, you hear the sounds. Yeah. And he said one day he, he woke up and he, and he heard all this noise and he looked out the window and he saw the shingles on the house next door going up and down like typewriter keys. Oh, and he said, weird. he suddenly realized this was the Jap a Japanese attack. It was machine gun fire hitting the roof on the house next door. And that was the beginning of the assault on Pearl Harbor. And my mother was by that time, uh, eight months pregnant with my brother. And so they they threw her into a into a um, into a jeep and drove her way up into the mountains um, where she stayed and he didn't see her for a month and um, he was uh, he said he he remembers uh, he me remembered pulling out the drawer of his desk and looking in, the, in the, and he saw there was an eight millimeter camera and his revolver and he, he said he hesitated for a moment about which to grab but he grabbed his revolver and his helmet got in the Jeep and started looking after all these people that had been injured in the, in the um, assault. Yeah. So, uh, and then when my mother, so when it was safe, they thought it was safe. They sent my mother and my, and my then baby brother, who was, who's my older brother, um, back to the United States. And my mother went to live with her parent, her mother and his, and her stepmother, stepfather in Chicago. And, um, and my father, when, as soon as the war was over, um, came home. And, and when he came home, uh, he went back to Chicago, not knowing really anything about it. And he tried to get, a, he wanted to be an obstetrician and he tried to find a residency in obstetrics and there wasn't one. So the only thing that was available was a psychiatric residency. So he took it. Mm -hmm. um, and he ended up being, uh, he then ended up training in psychoanalysis. He was one of the first um, child psychoanalyst trained at the Chicago Institute, which was fairly new at that time, uh, right after the war. And he became ultimately the president of the Psychoanalytic Society in Chicago. So that was my back, my, my parents' background. Well, thank you. When so I was much. growing up. Uh, and I, we're, 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 you grew up basically in Chicago. Uh, in the and suburbs. In the suburbs of Chicago. Chicago, yes, by the park. Right. Yeah. So, um, 
So I, I was in, Glen, in Glencoe, which is the furthest north suburb on the lake that was still part of Cook County. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, I was in a suburban high school. It was a fairly affluent area. Um, and um, I was just, um, I think I've always been a very independent character. I think I had some, uh, I think I probably would have been diagnosed as a slightly dyslexic if I had anybody done that in those days. <laughs> but I was a slow reader. Um, and um, and I also was kind of a rebellious character. So I never really wanted to, I was bored in school. I never wanted to do what everybody else was doing in school. So in the fourth grade, uh, they were going to hold me back a year because they said I couldn't read. And my mother knew perfectly well I was reading at home. I just didn't want to do it in school. And so she went into school and they handed me the workbook and I did the year's workbook in an hour. And the teacher, of course, was furious because then she realized that I was just not doing it. Um, and I had a similar kind of experience all the way through school. And, I, you know, when I was in the eighth grade, I just didn't want to be in the classroom. So they, you know, I was very lucky. I had very, um, I had very insightful teachers who tolerated this. But I had a teacher who said to me, well, if you don't want to be in class, go into the science room and just go look at the rocks and the mm -hmm. plants. And, you know, and that's how I spent my, my middle school years, never going to class. And then when I got to high school, I had a similar kind of experience where I was just, it was felt like a factory to me, and I didn't want to be there. And I start, and I was very lucky because I ran into a, a uh, an art teacher in the high school, who um, who would sign me out to his class when he knew perfectly well I wasn't there, um, because he knew that I wasn't lazy. He just, he, but that I wasn't interested in class. So I would <laughs> go to some classes, and I and he taught me how to make how to carve stone and carved wood. And I started making sculpture. And very quickly, I was welding sculpture in my father's garage. And I was spending the day making sculpture in my father's garage. And I would sometimes go to my English classes, which I liked. And then I started taking two English classes at the same time. So that by the middle of my third year, I had enough credits really to graduate, except for gym. And they wouldn't graduate me from, the, from high school without four years of gym. And, um, and I decided to apply to, to college on my own. And the school guidance counselor said, there's no way you're going to get into college with that record. We're not even going to send your transcript. They refused to send it. And my father had to go into school and say, you don't have a right not to send it. You have to send it whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. So they did. And I, I applied myself to, to Harvard, not knowing anything. My father knew no one who'd ever gone to an Ivy League school. I got onto a train and I went to Cambridge, Massachusetts and made an appointment with the director of admissions and I somehow managed to persuade him to accept me into college. So I really didn't have a high school degree, but I got into Harvard. When I got into Harvard, the people in the high school were so mad at me because, because of that. And they also thought my father had some kind of connections, which was a big joke. And um, so anyway, so then I went to college, and in college, I was much more interested in things, but it was hard for me because I wasn't a good reader. Um, I, and, I, and I specifically took the hardest classes I could take because somehow I had in my head that that would be better for me. So, you know, I, um, but the thing that really made me the, an art historian, you know, I, so I was making sculpture in high school, welding, and when I got to Harvard, there was, Harvard is, Harvard and the University of Chicago are probably the two universities in America that, that are so completely logocentric that they had no facilities even for somebody to do art. Mm -hmm. They didn't take it seriously. And so I went around and I found an, a, um, a building in the Radcliffe Yard that, uh, that had been converted to oil heat and had an old coal bin. And they gave me the coal bin as a studio because it was fireproof. And I welded sculpture in there from my four years at Harvard. Oh, but it was well, in the middle of the night. And, um, you know, so that's what I, I, I that's kind of, I was doing that. And then I also took a, um, my freshman year of college, I took a, an art history class on 17th century Dutch painting with a professor named Seymour Sly, who was just wonderful. And, oh. you know, it kind of changed my life. I had no idea there was such a thing as an art historian. I didn't know. My mother had been a painter. My father was a psychoanalyst. So I was interested in both of those things already. 
Um, but it never occurred to me that you could actually make a living as an artist or ha have a career as an artist. So I start. I discovered art history, and I started. To, and I took his class, which I just loved, um, mm -hmm. and that started me taking more art history classes. Um, and then I started writing for the college newspaper, and nobody had written art criticism for the college newspaper because the Harvard Crimson was only about the city council meetings and the politics. Cool. And my class, cool. my, cool. yeah, my, <laughs> yeah. So my classmates were all were all. Um, you know, they're amazing people, really. If you look today at who's on the front pages, the who has the bylines in the New York Times and the Washington Post, those were my classmates. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. Linda Greenhouse was in on the Crimson with me. She writes on the court for the New York Times. And Bob Samuelson, who was an economics commentator for the Post, for Newsweek and then the Post. Donnie Graham, whose mother owned the Washington Post, was uh, the editorial uh, yeah. was the president of course. when I was there. Um, so I, I mean, they, they, all of my classmates went on to become journalists. And I was so naive. I just didn't understand how important those connections are. And I think if I were, you asked me earlier, what, you know, what, what advice would I give myself at, at, a tw at 20, you know, looking back now, mm -hmm. I wish I'd understood better how important the relations between people really are, that you, it, you start to build a network and everything is about personal relations in the mm -hmm. end. Yeah, um, so I, I definitely will take your advice. And uh, but what a fantastic American story! And your grandparents and came to this country for the first time as basically refugees and yes. visited Island Island. And uh, then their their son became a professor and a prominent psychoanalyst. Then their grandson becomes a very prominent art historian. And just uh, absolutely, and two quick questions. What, what, when you grew up in Chicago as the third generation immigrant, basically, because your father was born here, right. so your grandparents was first generation, your father, parents were second generation, your third generation, did you feel any different from the other children? And uh, e uh, obviously, uh, English language was your, uh, your parents' first language, was it's your first language. But uh, do you feel any different, any uh, aside from your personality, anything? But uh, do you feel like you are different from other uh, kids in the neighborhood? Well, when I was a kid. You know, I li we lived in an area that was affluent, very highly educated, and there was a fairly reasonable, I mean, there's a reasonably sized Jewish population. So um, at first, I, I didn't really notice any difference. But then yep. there were other suburbs around me, wealthier suburbs around me, where some of the parents didn't want their kids playing with a Jewish, with a Jew. <laughs> and I didn't, it never occurred to me, you know, so I, I, I remember I had one high school friend who I, I met. Who um, we kept making ten tennis dates, and every time I made a tennis date with him, his mother would find something else for him to do, and it never worked out. And finally, my father said to me, um, "You're going to have to realize that uh, this is never going to happen because his mother doesn't want want his want him playing with a Jew." Mm. So there was some of that. There yeah, was some yeah. anti-Semitism, but I never really suffered from it. I would say, you know, it just. It, it struck me as so stupid, and I just, you know, I never took it seriously because it seemed stupid. And oh, certainly, no. yeah, and you couldn't, you couldn't possibly go to Harvard um, and, uh, and feel challenged by that because, you know, the professors and students at Harvard, there were so many prominent Jewish mm -hmm. um, faculty and students. I never really encountered that very much in my life. Um, although I have to say now, um, with all the violence going on in America, it's the first time in my life I ever thought to myself, is it possible that they could round up Jews like they did in Hitler's Germany? Because it feels to me like we're starting to go in that direction. Yeah, fortunately. But uh, I, as an immigrant myself, I never understand the anti-Semitism in this country. I, I just, I study history, I look at, I read it, uh, articles, I talk to my Jewish friends, and uh, non-Jewish friends, I, and everybody gave me different answers why this ha happened and why this is happening. Right. And nobody uh, really 
give me a clear answer. What's the rationale? Obviously, there is no logic be, behind this anti-Semitism. Uh, we are running out of time. What a fantastic American story. But I do want to ask you the question. And because we talk about you grew up in, uh, as a child uh, in Chicago, uh, we, and you published three books about the children's art. And uh, one is a theoretical book, two more art historian catalogs. So when did you begin to pay attention to children's art? And one, why do you think it's important? Well, you know, um, as I said to you, you know, I was never a great reader and I was always interested in visual things. That's how I learned. And I didn't understand until this point in my life, um, you know, all the different styles of learning that people do learn visually instead of um, verbally. Some people do. And I'm probably one of them. So I've always I've always wanted to know what what it is that um, why it is that images have such a strong claim on my attention. And when I was in high school, I already was interested in children's drawings. Um, I'm not sure why, but I think it's because my father was a psychoanalyst and I started reading psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic literature as a high school student. And when I got to Harvard, I started investigating it. And I had, I had two very formative teachers in college who really were important to me. One was Rudolf Arnheim, who was a, oh, yeah. uh, who was a Berlin Jew. He had emigrated to the United States during World War II. And, um, and he was an expert on children's drawings and on the psychology of art. He was kind of the father of the psychology of art. Definitely. And he, yes. he and I ultimately got to be very good friends and published together. So he's, you know, that was one very important relationship. And the other one that was important to me was a man named Eric Erickson, mm -hmm. who was mm -hmm. a psychoanalyst um, teaching at Harvard. And at the time that I knew him, he, had, he was working on a book called Gandhi's Truth. Mm -hmm. And the and, and what he said in Gandhi's Truth and in other books that he wrote, he created a paradigm, which is that, you know, Gandhi solved his personal emotional problems in public, in a way that other people could identify with, and that was, and in Erickson's view, that was how ideology forms. That, you know, somebody does this in public, mm -hmm. it, you know, that's the beginning of ideology. And I thought, boy, that is the that's the way to explain why a work of art has so much impact on us. So it sent me on that trajectory, and now I'm at the place where I'm working in neuroscience, trying to understand the the actual physiology of the brain on a work of art. What happens in creativity, and how does creativity work, um, and how does it get uh, transferred? And I'm thinking Erickson and Arnheim were essential for me to, and my father were essential for me to understand those issues. Definitely, I agree. Totally agree. I read Arnheim's books. Was my Bible during my college yeah. years, and I definitely agree with you uh, about the neuroscience part of the art, you know, the children's art. And I love Castle's uh, famous quote that every child was an artist. The problem is how to remain it when we grow up. Well, what a fantastic conversation and what a fantastic American history, American story of your family, your grandparents, your parents, and yourself. Thank you so much for, for your time, Professor. And, uh, and let's just get this as episode one of our oral history <laughs> book of Feinberg, Professor Feinberger's uh, you know, uh, personal journey. And I wish I, we will have you back on the show to continue to talk about the children's art and other things. Well, thank you again for your time, Professor. Today, we have a distinguished guest, Professor Jonathan Feinberg, Director of a PhD Program in Creativity at the University of the Arts, art historian, curator, my mentor for 22 years, and will for at least another 28 years. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's always great to talk to you. Likewise. Aloha.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.